Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And we need you. As we look into your word further this morning, we pray that your spirit will guide us and that we will obey that guidance to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. First Samuel. I, uh, chapter 27, verse 1. Or Samuel 27, verse 1. said in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines and Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel so I shall escape out of his hand. Now hopefully we recall that twice David has spared Saul's life, right? And twice Saul has said, you know, forgive me, I will not do this thing to you, that sort of thing. And um, does David believe that Saul is not going to try to kill him? No, he doesn't. I mean, he just says, states it right out, right? He says, uh, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. He believes that Saul, no matter what he says, is, is hell-bent on... Uh, killing him. So what did he decide to do? What did we just read that he's decided he's going to do? Yeah. He's decided to go to the one place Saul's afraid to go. Right. The Philistines. Yeah. The arch enemies of the, uh, arch enemies of the Jews. There's so many battles between the Philistines and, and Israel. And that's where he's going to go. Saul won't chase after me there. So I'll be safe there. Now, but we'll continue. I had something I was going to say, but I think the word will reveal it. Then David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath. He and his men, each with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. And David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, then let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. Or why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now time that David had dwelt, that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one year and four months. So what a short time. It wasn't just a visit. He stayed there and he made arrangements for housing, for a place to be, for his men, for his, for his wives. Uh, he moved to the land of the Philistines. Okay? And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to shore, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but he took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, Where have you made a raid today? And David would say, Against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremielites, or against the southern area of of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, lest they should form on us, saying, Thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time that he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore he will be my servant forever. So what is the scam? 
what's the what's the what's the line David is feeding to uh, the Philistines? What's David doing? What is he actually doing? He's attacking Amalekites. Is that Israelites? No, enemies. That's right, enemies. He's attacking. Where, where, where are the rest? The, 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 yeah, the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, for these nations were the inhabitants of the land of from, from of old. So they were the previous <laughs> inhabitants of the land. They were the ones that God sent Israel to drive out of the land, and they haven't been completely driven out yet, so David's going after these ancient enemies of Israel. Yes? It was essentially, he was helping Israel while telling the Philistines that he was doing the exact opposite, essentially telling them what they wanted to hear to make him sound better. Is Alex interpreting the passage correctly? I think so. <laughs> Going against the enemies of Israel, not against Israel. Yes. The whole situation is not yeah. Yes! <laughs> because if you remember from 1 Samuel 21, David went to Ahish, the king of Gath, pretending to be insane and having spit go down his beard. Now suddenly he shows up and he's just fine. He's in his right mind, and Ahish is like, okay, I'll, I'll let you stay here, even though you've killed so many Philistines, including you know, Goliath, who was from our city. And he gives them his own city to dwell in, and now David is just lying through his teeth. So at first that like a madman, but now he's acting like a traitor. It makes you wonder if Akish is maybe not so smart. Maybe Akish had a son that he named after himself. <laughs> I don't know. That's odd. That really is odd. Yes. They might have thought they were kind of crazy to begin with when he went up against Goliath. <laughs> well, now that's right. And he was from Gath. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, do we know how many, so we know that David has 600 men. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to visually to like see what that would look like. It's pretty scary. So I would yeah. Do. yeah. Do we know the person that he's um, um, manipulating here? Do we know what kind of, does he have more of an army, obviously? Well, he runs the city. It's a, it's the city of Gath. And the, yeah. There were more people. I don't know how many, but there were more. There were more, yeah. Um, so Akish is being told what? What's he being told? A lie. A lie. And that lie was, I'm attacking the southern parts of Israel, basically. The southern parts of Israel. The Israelites or, or allies of the Israelites. Right? Going after going after those people. And how is he how is he um, confirming that lie? How is he making that look, lie to be true? Yes, Emily. Well, he's pulling off the human inhabitants and he's counting on the donkeys not talking. There you go. I have heard donkeys talk before, though. Anyway, that's another. Um, the, um, right, he killed all the humans, kept the livestock and all the other goods, and so there, nobody was none the wiser because of this, of this deception that David was... Uh, perpetrating on these enemies of Israel. Okay? Um, so what do you think about all that? Anybody disturbed about this? It is a little disturbing. You know what I love about the Bible, though? One of the things I love about the Bible, and I think it adds to its actual believability, is that God allows these Things that I would have cut out of the story if I had been writing it. He allows these things to appear in the story. David, the man after God's own heart, is presented to us warts and all. We see his deception. We see the murder. We see the we see the um, the way he's working here. That's not completely admirable. And yet God allowed that part of his life to be revealed to us. It really does enhance my uh, um, my uh, desire to, to believe what is written here. Wes and then, uh, and then Matthew. It, but is it really all that admirable? Yeah, he's, he's sure he's lying to Akish. 
Mm-hmm. But Achish, I mean, the Philistines are an enemy of Israel. He might not have the throne, but he is the anointed king of Israel. He has no responsibility yeah. or expectation to deal honestly with Philistia. With, with, the, with the enemy. Yeah. And so what he's do what he's doing here while he's while he's away from Israel, being driven out by the king who is currently sitting on the throne, mm-hmm. is taking care of Israel. Israel. The land he's going to inherit. Yeah, he, he's taking care of his people mm-hmm. by dealing with their enemies. Right. And also lying to another one of their enemies. So, I mean... Yeah. I have a feeling Akish probably couldn't have seen through this. The if very fact, tried. though, to the point that I was trying to make, the very fact that we're having a discussion about this, and when I asked you know, ask people, does this seem a little disturbing to you? Everybody said, yeah. Or not to you, but, but to others, they were nodding, yeah. <laughs> the very fact that this is kind of, again... If I were writing this story, I would have written it different. That's why I believe that God, to me, that adds to the divine inspiration of the scripture because this story is this is just presented right here. And you're right; He was defending Israel. I, I, I don't dispute that at all. And yes, uh, 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 Matthew, and then uh, Pearl. So, I, in that case, you can also look at what David's doing as an extension of what Israel should have been doing. That's He's finishing the job. Yeah, those people should not have mm-hmm. been in the land. Mm-hmm. They had the time of Joshua. They had all the time of the judges. And they had the entire reign of Saul mm-hmm. to get rid of these people. So it's funny that the murder he's doing isn't really murder. It's, no, it's, it's not. fulfilling the command of God. But the deception is at least a little bit of a problem, even if it is the enemies of God. Is even when we take that forward to today, we look at our enemies, we don't get to lie to them or deceive them or take advantage of them. We are to be good to them and bless them and help them. Our methods are different. Yeah. 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 Uh, Earl? I always have to remember back as to why God said that these people were to be destroyed. It's not just because he wants them out of the land. Right. It's because of the immense wickedness with which they live. Their religion was sacrificing children, their idolatry, their lasciviousness, their yeah. sexual perversion, <coughs> and it was just really, really horrible the things they were doing. They done. And God had already, uh, when Israel was in Egypt, he had waited 400 years for them to put it to mature into their complete evil, and that's he said, we got to get rid of them. That's, that's right. what that was all about. So these are the same people, and they're probably still practicing the same stuff. Yeah. So when David is wiping them out, he's not wiping out these pure little innocent people. He's cleansing the land. He's cleansing the land of an ideology and, mm-hmm. and, a, and a religious practice that's horrible. Right. And I would ask you, if God is patient for 400 years before he wipes those people out, do you think that's the same, the same God that we have today that just looking at our land and seeing the people in our country. God help us. God help us. Yes. So I mean as, as as individuals, Jesus expects us to behave in a certain way. Mm-hmm. However, when nations go to war, deception is a vital part of the battle. And so kind of have to look at it from a, a national perspective here yeah. and say, yeah, well. I'm supposed to get rid of these people. I'm going to do whatever I need to. Got to get rid of them. All right. Yes. I had uh, someone say once that uh, lying is a form of violence. And violence can be aggressive, but it can also be defensive. It's like when the Nazis come to your door and say, you have any Jews in the basement? You lie because you're defending their lives. And do the same thing here. He's defending life. Like when Rahab saved the, uh, the spies. Yeah. Wow. Any other thoughts? Yes. Well, the other interesting thing is, even though David's doing that, not leaving anyone alive, he's not killing the Philistines. <laughs> and throughout this whole journey that we're going to go through right. these next few chapters, it's Philistines not. being the primary enemy of God's people, he leaves them alone. Mm-hmm. He does. Wes. 
So, so for, in verse five, we kind of we kind of skip the skip through the part his dialogue with Akish a little bit. We I guess we covered it a little bit, but he says, "If I found favor in your eyes, it makes me wonder what exactly David did <clears throat> to find favor in Akish's eyes in such a way that." That age mm-hmm. should be like, oh yeah, here's a city, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like, here's a little, here's a little city for you to have. Well, is and, it possible that I mean, sometimes the chronology is not exact. Yeah, it is possible. This is, is a possible result. He's already of, started the raiding and things like that before. Yeah, maybe. Yes. Well, it's also possible, and, and it's said in other places that David is the commander of Saul's army, and that is as you know violent as he is and as good a warrior as he is, it's better to have him on your side and defecting to your country to fight mm-hmm. against your enemy mm-hmm. rather than having to go up against him in battle. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to see something about that in just a few verses, aren't we? Okay. Anything else in here that you noticed that got your attention? Okay. Sometimes... Um, now again, David is the anointed king of Israel. He's going to inherit the kingship. And how is he having to live right now? Outside of God's people, outside of God's country, kind of by his wits, who he can round up to go with him. Uh, he's not in a, in a place of establishment at all, is he? He's basically living, he's having to live as an outlaw. Uh, finding allies where he can, and uh, and yet this is the man after God's own heart. So what can we expect maybe might come our way as we walk with God? Or we Can we expect every day we're going to just go back home to our houses like we do every day? And everything's, I mean, it, it could, things could descend into chaos for us as well. Are we better than David? No. Okay. Yes. Well, we can paint the picture that in Revelation 2 and 3, mm-hmm. the people were avoiding persecution by compromising and by participating in a society that was idolatrous and mm-hmm. even paying lip service to the emperor and things like that. So when it comes down to it, if we're doing this right, we'll face problems. If we find ourselves compromising, there's a good chance we'll have peace, but on peace we go. Right. That's right. Compromise doesn't work. Now, <clears throat> did we read the whole chapter? We did, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next one? I, I do want to key in on the very last verse. Achish believed David, saying he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him, therefore he will be my servant forever. So David was effective enough in this deception that that Achish thought, well, he's one of, he's, he's gone full Benedict Arnold. He is, he is on my side for good, and he's not going to turn, he's not going to turn back. He thought he had an ally in David. Yes? Yeah, and you see that throughout this entire story. He will never waver from that point of view, even though others try to get him to. And it shows the power of the mind that you can deceive yourself into believing almost anything, even when the evidence is right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, verse, chapter 28. Now it happened in these days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, you're assuredly, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. So what trust does Achish have in David? It's full and complete. And what is Achish expecting from David? To fight against to fight against Israel as he already had been doing, so he thought. And David gives an answer that sounds a little weaselly. 
ambiguous. <laughs> a little ambiguous, but Akish, you know, he, he accepted that as a positive answer, right? And uh, so here we are. So this is the dilemma that David is facing. What is he going to do now? I've, uh, now has come the, the point where, you know, it's not going to be so easy to slip slide and, 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 and get, get around it. You know, he's, 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 the choices are going to have to be made. But we go to another story. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Now we've got to commend Saul for that. He did get rid of the witches in Israel. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. They're getting ready for battle. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams, or by Udom, or by the prophets. So what's Saul's situation? Yeah. He's finally reaching out to God, but it's too late. Yeah. Today is the day of salvation. Today. Take care of business today. Um, he's crying out, and he's not hearing anything. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. Now he had already banished the witches from Israel. And here he is at the end of his life. We know what's going to happen. He's going to die soon. He's at the end of things. And at the end of things, once again, he goes in a compromising direction. What was the first place where he, where we see his character that is very similar to, to this action? When he was waiting on Samuel. Y'all remember the beginning of Saul's reign when he was waiting on Samuel? He waited long enough. Samuel delayed. He was late. Samuel was late. Okay? And what did he do? He offered, the, he offered the sacrifice, but he was not authorized to do. He wasn't authorized to do that. So he, he took, he, he, for expediences sake, he did something he didn't need to do. And then when, and then we see in the, just a little review of Saul's character in the matter of the Amalekites. They were to destroy them all. He did not destroy them all. And who remembers the excuse that he made when he didn't destroy them all? Who remembers what he said? Say the best for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Afterward, the people made him do it. The people. He said something about the people. The people, you know, again, for expedience's sake. It's always about some outside force forcing him to do something. And you can almost hear him say in this instance, although we don't hear him say it, but you can almost hear him say, well, if God's not going to talk to me, what else can I do? But go off in this direction. Have you ever made an excuse like that? I tried doing it God's way, but it didn't work. I've heard that a few times by people. Yes? It's been kind of a human trait from the God, because what did Adam say when God confronted him? That this woman. woman who you gave me <laughs> caused me to do it. It was not my fault, it's hers. There we are. And, and that has continued on where men have, uh, people have, fail to take responsibility for their own action. Mm -hmm. now, and and so to contrast to that, we have David mm -hmm. after he's been yeah. confronted by Nathan. If you read Psalm 51, he totally owned what he did. He realized how awful it was. And he realized how sinful he was. And he repented heartily before God. And uh, asked, please don't take your spirit away from me. Right. He could have said, as you did to Saul. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know, yeah. created me a clean heart, yeah. and so forth. 
Yeah. yeah. David, you took responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, you can see him making excuses for murdering Uriah, though, when he was in his insanity, right? Well, I've got to get rid of him. I've got to get rid of him. Uh, yes? And it is a common thing to see in the Bible, and even today, if people don't feel like God is listening to them or answering them the way they want to be answered, they will go find another way to mm -hmm. receive it. <clears throat> and it's not always the best way, but at least to Saul's credit, He's not seeking out a foreign god or a malevolent spirit or anything like that. He's seeking out insane. But give him that much. Yeah. 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 He is trying to he is he's trying to get Samuel by any means necessary. Because he knew God would answer Samuel. Yeah. All right. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one that I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off all the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, as the Lord lives, do you see how twisted he is? Yeah. <laughs> but as the Lord lives, no punishment will come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And she said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I'm deeply distressed. <clears throat> for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing that the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by you. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord or execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Thoughts? I've got the joy, 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 joy. <laughs> it's not a happy, it's not a happy message, is it? Yes. Saul told his servants, find me a woman who is a medium. I think that indicates that the large number of those type persons were female. And today we still find that to be true for fortune tellers, palm readers, crystal ball gazers. I listen to WSMN, which is a conservative talk radio station, and it frequently has a young female voice advertising that she is a medium. So I it's it's well got a real appeal. It does have a real appeal. Uh, uh, another thing I wanted to say, <laughs> we all know that Saul was in shoulders above the men in Israel. Do you not think that that witch recognized him immediately? You think she Saul? should have. You think she should have, don't you? Oh, absolutely. But, but it doesn't she knew him. who he was. Oh, do you think right at the beginning even? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, he disguised himself. Why did she not indicate that she recognized him until later? She was afraid. She wanted to probably do his bidding. 
staying alive was a number one uh, objective for her. Okay. Uh, let's get to the, let's, let's talk about the message that was delivered to him by Samuel. What, what did Samuel say? You're going to die you're tomorrow. Dead. You'll you're be with me. You and your sons, you'll be with me. You'll be with me tomorrow. Where's that? Sheol. That's where he's going to be. Hades. Uh, was there any hope given? In this message. No. Rich. The other sad part is, is because of his disobedience, all of Israel was going to be handed over to the Philistines. All of his what? All of the Israelites were going to be handed over to the Philistines because of his disobedience. Because of his disobedience. Okay. So what's his legacy going to be? Not good. Wes. Yeah. So, so you asked if there's any hope. And the question of that is, well, for who? Because he does mention it, the, the kingdom will torn, be torn out of your hands and given to your neighbor, David. Well, hope for David, yes. Who will take, yeah, <laughs> who will take the kingdom and be the rightful king. And God's promise will be fulfilled. <laughs> so there is hope in this, just not for Saul. There, there's hope for those of us who call on the name of the Lord and walk in his paths and, and are, his, are his children and walk as his children. But Saul had walked uh, another way. Yes. An aside a little bit. Um, it, it, it seems to me that this does show that mediums and these people who practice some of these arts have some real power. There's something going on there. Something's going on there. However, you notice Saul didn't see Samuel. He asked her what she saw. And he bowed down. Effectively, it sounds like to me to her, because in a sense, she was speaking to her. <coughs> so, if if that's the case, then people who seek out a medium and ask for somebody don't necessarily get who they ask for. They may be getting some power, <coughs> some spiritual power, some evil power, some deceiving spirit who's deceiving them. Mm -hmm. Could be. In this case, it really was Samuel. Yeah. Uh, but it is it is a deceptive art that they that they practice. Yes, and, and I think that's an important thing because some people will say, "Oh no, she has no power, and God did this, and that's the only reason it happened." But He tells us not to mess with these things for a reason, and there is danger to it. But it was Samuel. He knew who Saul was. He knew why Saul was not being answered. But he also knew what was going to happen, which is very interesting because. Somehow, some way in Sheol, he had access to what the plans of God were, and he was able to accurately describe that to Saul. Yeah. Yes. I love Samuel's response to Saul. Why have you disturbed me? Why do you bother me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm. 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 In, I'm, I'm dead. In, you know. Let me rest in peace. You know. <laughs> I'm in the, the present. I'm absent from the body and present with the Lord. Why do you? You know. Yeah. yeah why are you doing this? Um, please let this be a warning to you. Saul, somewhere along the line, passed the point of no return. You know, but this, uh, he, it, it was, it was, he, he is clearly without hope. He, even though he's still breathing, he is clearly without hope at this, at this point. This is going to come to pass. And it is possible to be so hardened that you are not going to repent and all you have, look, have to look for, for, forward to is something very, very fearful. Yes? <coughs> to your point before the sermon this morning, talking about if you are a good example in somebody's life, mm -hmm. that when they have need, they'll reach out to you. Even Saul, as just depressed and despaired as he was in this instance, His so when friend. God wasn't answering him, he went to the one man who had always been godly in his life to seek advice. Right. And, you know, despite what I said a moment ago, I hope that Saul had some sort of last minute 
conversion and crying out to God, but that is not described in Scripture. I mean, I, I don't hope for his destruction. I don't hope for anybody's destruction. But the Bible I read tells me there is a point at which repentance is not going to, repentance is not going to happen, and therefore redemption is not going to happen. Yes? Right. I mean, and, and the New Testament echoes that. Yeah. Perfectly right. You asked what the point of it no return is. It states more clearly than I just did. Yeah. And the, the point of no return was the first time somebody <laughs> got on to Saul for messing up, and Saul just said, "Oh yeah, yeah okay, whatever." Yeah. Right. <laughs> like the the first time that Saul was rebuked and did not repent was the point of no return. From then on, it was it clear that he had no intent of repenting for his bad behavior and just just going to do what he wanted to do, and it has led him here. Doing that's why the what he wanted to do. <laughs> blessed. That's why the beatitudes are blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you poor in spirit? Are you humble in heart? Are you able to say, I have sinned when confronted with your sin? What, what's the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy against. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and probably unrepentance. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, I think would, that would have to go along with it. Yes. Yep. Yes. Not, not, not refusal, refusal to be uh, coachable, refusable, refusal to repent. Yes. I was going to say, you, you're talking about that, that that point is coming, that point of no return, which is why God wants, wants us to do very much, as much as possible, what's written, what's on that wall right behind it. <laughs> yes, yes. Going <laughs> to all the world, that's right. Yes, Matthew. We also learned some things about God here that are echoed throughout the entire Bible, is that God is not just someone who will let you do whatever you want and accept you. And there are points where if you are living in sin, even if you cry out to God, he's not necessarily going to answer you. And he does love you, and he wants you to come back. But as long as you're continuing to live in sin, there's no help there. You have to have that humble repentance, and you have to be willing to change, because you can get to a point where even God won't listen to you. Again, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you poor in spirit? Do you have a tender heart? Are you willing, when, when, when you recognize that you've sinned or that someone else has called it to your attention, are you instructable in that moment? Or do you harden yourself like Pharaoh did? And remember with Pharaoh, he hardened, 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 and then it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In the beginning, Pharaoh was doing the hardening, but then God took it out of Pharaoh's. And if you think that's kind of harsh, <clears throat> that God would allow people to continue breathing that he knows are never going to repent, every one of us are going to reach a point of no return. <clears throat> every one of us. Where if we have repented, then hallelujah. And if we haven't, repentance will be denied to us because every one of us are going to die. <clears throat> so the, the, the point is there are some dead men who are still walking well, I don't know who they are but there are some that are, that are dead men walking yes um, I just was thinking <clears throat> of um, when you were talking about um, some that reached the point of no return um, you know God knows this and um, there's a verse about the potter and the clay I don't know exactly who it is but um, I think with that, it's like our Creator um, can, can use us for good. Or for ill. Or for ill. And, or for Ill. and if we're already perishing. Now, if you're worried if you're one of those people, <clears throat> we are told in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the very ability to say Jesus is Lord comes from where? That comes from God Himself. That comes from the Holy Spirit. No man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you think, oh my goodness, I've, I've gone too far, do you still have the ability to just say from the heart and with intention and with faith that you believe that Jesus is Lord? Then you haven't reached that point. You haven't reached that point. Because God would not be condescending to dwell and work in you 
to the ability. That very ability only comes from God. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's a simple test, really. That if you're worried that you've gone too far, you probably have it. Right. Because you're worried about it. Because you're concerned about your sin. Yeah. yeah. In, in Hebrews six four through six, it talks about people where it can be impossible to restore them to repentance. Right. Because they are no longer concerned about repenting, right. either because they don't care anymore, or they've convinced themselves that what they're doing wrong is actually okay. Right. <clears throat> so, again, this is really a sad passage in Scripture. And I hope you'll take it as a warning. Don't, don't be cavalier with sin. You know, if you discover you've done something wrong, deal with it. And if there's somebody that you need to make amends with, give them a phone call. Make that call. And if there's some pain that you've caused, talk to God about it. He's ready to forgive. He's willing to forgive. He died so that you could be forgiven. But don't just ignore it. Don't live in denial. It'll, it'll, that, that won't go well for you. It'll just pile up higher and higher and higher. Okay. It is now 11.43. Let's um, get to the... Let's go a little bit further. It says, Immediately Saul fell full length from the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him for he eaten no food all day or all night. So here Saul is. He's without food. He's without strength. And he's without God. And the only message he's heard from God is not an encouraging message. Um, lately, I've been reflecting on the hardships of life and trying to speculate on how I would even begin to try to handle them without the knowledge that God was involved in me. I don't know how, I, I just, I can't imagine how I would handle it. I, I, I can't imagine the despair that Saul must have been feeling. Where were his allies? He had nothing. He had nothing except regret. Don't let that happen to you. Yes? Even as, in his own character, he didn't go to this medium or to seek out God's help because he was concerned about God's name or concerned about God's people. He was afraid of those things. He went out of fear. Yeah. And learning that his fear was now founded and that he was going to perish, mm -hmm. he's lost it all. No hope. He was completely, completely, it was all sucked out. Don't let that happen to you. You know, I, I watched my mother die and she did not die without hope. She had hope. She fought to the very end, and then she kissed Daddy and, and went on home to be with Jesus. And it was beautiful and awful at the same time. You know, I, I miss her, but I saw her go to glory. Yeah. The tragic, uh, the tragic figures here really are the people who have followed this all, because they they think they're following the Lord's anointed. They mm -hmm. think they're following the King of Israel, and mm -hmm. they are. But they're deceived in that he's really not the king anymore, David is. Right. But, but they go out with, with full intention to obey the Lord mm -hmm. and to do what's right and fight this battle. And they all get wiped out. And they get wiped out. And they leave behind widows and orphans mm -hmm. and great tragedy. Poverty. Just, yeah. yeah. All right. You get the last word, Rich Therian. Well, I just. Uh, in today's society and throughout society, different cults that, you know, people mass suicides all for the purpose of God. It's insane. It's insane. Yeah. You know, all gods. Um, all right, so what we're going to do here, I think we have the final one. I'm going to leave y'all to read the rest of this chapter and yourselves, and next week we'll pick up at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 29, the battle. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your wisdom. Uh, I thank you for this warning. Uh, we thank you that you are forgiven. But we know that one day uh, that um, 
our last chance of repentance will be given to us. And so, Lord, I pray that we will have, we will cultivate that support us in spirit, that tender heartedness, that desire to look inside and discover and destroy the iniquity in us. And we thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And may we look at what we've reflected on today as a warning that we can ease well, that we can simply avoid by walking with you and being humble rather than stubborn. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.